All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Elizabeth Siri. I'm the Executive Director of Communications and Development at Foundations, Inc. And I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of Perspectives from the Field. And we are so happy. Um, this series is made possible through the generous support of the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. Um, before we get started, I'll tell you a little bit about Foundations, Inc. We are a national education nonprofit. We're located in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, and our mission is to improve the quality of education by building the skills of educators. So we work across the school day. We work in after school programs, with schools at the district level, and even with states in order to create a brighter future for every child every day. If you're interested in learning more about foundations, um, take a minute to follow us on social media. We'll make sure that that information is in the chat for you. Uh, you might already know us from our signature professional learning experience, the Beyond School Hours Conference. Our conference is held each year in February, and we are so excited that in 2022, we're gonna be back in Orlando, Florida, and we hope that you'll all join us. So registration is open. The hotel is filling up fast. I think everybody is looking for a chance to get out and get back in person, and we are too. So we're super excited about that. We also feature the Perspectives from the Field live event on Friday at the conference. So make sure you join us and you come check it out. Um, we are so excited to welcome our host, Sean Petty, who's Senior Study Director at Westat and our special guest, Melissa Park, who's the founder of the Black Teaching Artist Lab. So welcome both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you uh, so much, Elizabeth, for uh, having us, having us on the show, for welcoming us. And oh my goodness, I am so excited to talk to uh, Melissa and get to talk to uh, chat about some things today. It's gonna be a very, very exciting show. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Melissa, how are you? I am doing really well. I'm in Brooklyn, New York, and it's November, and it's the weather where it's like really hot in the morning, and then it gets like cold in the afternoon, or yeah, it's cold in the afternoon, and it's like you never know what you're gonna wear. So I'm currently wearing a sweater, but um, it's actually kind of hot out. So it's like I'm I'm in that space right now. How are you doing, Sean? Doing good, doing good. I'm I'm uh, in San Antonio, uh, so on the other, not on the other side, the middle of the country. Middle, right middle part. But for us, like we're having a cold snap, so it's like 60 outside. So for okay. us, like 60 is when we start wearing our sweaters. So a little, little strange, I guess. A little bit. In Texas, <laughs> I always think of it being really warm weather, but 60 must be a little freezing for you all. <laughs> It's, I have a colleague actually on the line named Chandler. She just typed in the chat room. Uh, she's so hilarious. Like she dresses up like in parkas whenever it drops like 60. She's, <laughs> she hates the, the cold weather, it's crazy. But I am so glad that you made it. I know you are a super busy person with so much in your life uh, going on, but I am so excited to highlight. I'm gonna put, um, I'm gonna put a couple of links in the chat room and I will bring these back up throughout our conversation today. But I mean, one of the big things that, um, oh, well, I'll have to actually grab the links. So I apologize for that. But one of the big conversations that, that we had when we first met was a little bit about you. And I think you have a fascinating story. So for our audience today, could you share a little bit about Melissa Park, like, who are you? Where do you come from? What's your passion? What's your heritage? You know, can you can you share a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So I'm Melissa Park, um, and I am born and raised uh, from in Brooklyn, New York, um, in a predominantly Caribbean uh, area, which is Flatbush. Um, and my parents, my dad's from Jamaica, and my dad, my mom is from Trinidad, and her parents are from Grenada, and they met around like in 1989 when they were like 20 and 19 years old like on Flatbush because of their aunts work together um, a typical Caribbean st American story uh, so my roots are definitely rooted in uh, Caribbean American <laughs> culture especially in New York um, 
And I think, you know, my educational background is so unique, as in, you know, the school that I went to is called Bay Ridge Prep, and, I, and it, like, officially was founded in 1999, and I came in in 2001, so it was this new school, had its own new philosophy, and here I was in second grade, with, and the classroom was so small, it's from kindergarten through second grade in one classroom, it was 20 kids. Um, and they were doing social emotional learning before it was social emotional learning. So, you know, we were able to, you know, we had this program called the bridge program where kids were had special education and there was also mainstream. Um, and my friend was in special education. She was like, I want to have a class where we're all together. And she did this huge speech in our history class and our principal and the administrators were in the classroom. And it was just really cool to kind of have like de declaring our needs and it being met. So we actually had a class where there was both mainstream and bridge. Um, and that was my educational experience. And I thought like this was where education was going. And um, it really wasn't. I went to college and I studied secondary education um, thinking that's what I want to do. And when I did student teaching, I realized that the school system in New York is very different than my own you know, private school experience. Um, and I was really discouraged, but I'm fortunate to be creative. Um, I play the bass and, um, you know, I write a lot, write a lot of uh, poetry and do a lot of blogging. Um, and let me to, pause right there. You play the bass? I do. I play the electric bass. I actually got a scholarship, too, from at college to play, um, Are you like which I don't really think about. <laughs> no, I don't. I actually, you know what? Lies. I did. We were in, this is actually so embarrassing, but we were, me and my friends decided to have a band okay. in high school um, because we wanted to get out of gym class. So we got our geometry, <laughs> we got our geometry teacher who also just is like a savant, like she knows so much about music. And we convinced her during her planning period to teach us like how to play a bass. And she taught us how to play the drums. <laughs> and uh, we got a gym class and I also learned how to play bass. So, um, but that was kind of learning environment I was in. Like you get to convince your, you know, your geometry teacher how to, to teach you an instrument during gym class. That's um, awesome. It was, it was really, really awesome. Um, Do you have a cool name, band name? I actually did. It's called. It was called. Uh, it's it's so embarrassing. I don't do not want to even name it. It was so. Um, things you look back on when you uh, are an adult when you're in high school. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, I I was very fortunate to you know be creative and also be passionate about education, which sort of circles back to Black Teaching Artist Lab being able to marry the two. Um, based on my own lived experiences. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think what we talked before about, you know, my heritage and, you know, being Caribbean American um, and my parents not coming from here, a lot of my experience um, and a lot of the connections I made are with folks, like a lot of my friends are first generation Italian, first generation, um, you know, Turkish. So, you know, having that background really also influenced the work that I do. Um, and through an artistic and also through a black lens. That's so, that's so fascinating. First of all, it's fascinating your, your heritage, your culture, the fact that you come from your parents and, and you know, you basically, uh, your essence comes from these island nations, but also you have that Brooklyn, you know, vibe going on in your particular community that you live in. Uh, what a, what a great celebration of life you must enjoy every day, no? Yeah, it's, it's. I don't know if you've ever been to Brooklyn, but Brooklyn it does have so much strong ties to, you know, the Caribbean, a lot of, in the 80s and 90s, so many um, nurses, they came from Jamaica to New York. Um, so there was a definitely, there's still a cultural surge there. Sure. Um, and it's cool, like it's, you know, people treat you like their family here and, and, you know, people in the stores treat you like their family. Um, it's really beautiful seeing that and and holding that cultural identity. Even though I rarely go to the Caribbean, I still, I still feel like I'm, I'm still there in Brooklyn. And that's still, is that, so it's still there? Like the, cause you, you hear about, you know, various cities across the United States and, 
and sometimes it feels like we're kind of losing our our culture sometimes we're getting caught up in the day to day and work and and everything but the way you described it just now it sounds like you know um uh, to me it, it feels like almost like a movie like people are friendly and there's this culture and celebration is that still going on yes and no yes there's still pockets of uh you know caribbean stores uh caribbean people but because of gentrification because it's so expensive to live especially in the part where i live is the prospect left for gardens it's uh it's just it's hard and i'm sure we see that across the board in any you know major cities and especially in new york city but um it's really difficult uh because of that but there's still i, I there you still see the richness and we still have car uh, carnival and juve still happen so uh we're still holding strong here in brooklyn now real quick what is juve okay so juve is um a celebration right the night before uh, carnival and you party and you play you, you paint my mom never let me went because it was always so late but um it's basically a celebration of you know carnival is really that it's historically is that one day you get to celebrate um yeah back when there was slavery is if one day you get to celebrate and juve is sort of like the pre-party type yeah. of uh event that happens um I'm I'm wanting to go in Trinidad in February because that's like one of the major places. Um, but they party, they they go hard in Juve in in Trinidad and, and other parts of in other side in the Caribbean. That's um, awesome. I mean, what a, what a fun time! Now, growing up in this culture and growing up um, with the influences that you have, is that what led you into what you do now? Did that give you the foundation or did you have like a aha moment one day and say, you know what, I'm going to create black teaching artist lab. You know, I'm, I think unconsciously, subconsciously, um, you know, anything you put your work, any work you put into it, I think you always put a part of yourself into it. Right. Um, but I really saw such a gap in resources for black educators especially black arts educators and it was really important for me you know we're we're in a state where we we talked we know we saw what happened to george floyd and we want to have these conversations about race and we want to have these conversations about uh how do we you know reach our black students but we really don't have these conversations about how do we support those black educators who who has the potential of really reaching those black ed black students? Um, so I really saw a gap, you know, in in those in conversations like that, and having conversations with black educators, it really made me think about, okay, like what would if I was in school, what resources would I want? I want to go travel and learn about my culture. I want to have a framework to better understand my black learners. I want to have a space where I could talk about certain issues that I don't have to feel like I have to explain my identity. So, you know, black teaching artists have definitely came from a need. And I think, you know, with the Pan-African Cultural Exchange, one of our programs really did come from my own personal understanding of West Africa and how it's so connected to my rootedness and being a Jamaican or being a Trinidadian uh, or Grenadian, you know, Jam Jamaica's national dish is Aki and Saltfish and Aki coming from West Africa. I know that culturally and just seeing those connections through art and culture, it's it's so interesting and, and important too. So, you know, yes, in both my, my cultural background definitely influenced it, but, you know, that need, that gap of of lack of resources motivated me to go beyond even what I thought I could do. I never thought I would be doing research, but here I am uh, doing that. Um, never thought I would be doing a pedagogical framework, but here I am doing it because uh, there's a need. No, I, I mean, um, obviously I've gotten to know you a little bit in chatting and um, you're like amazing because if you don't know something, you go like you were telling me the other day, you taught yourself in design so that you can make a magazine. And I on your website uh, for Black Teaching Artist Lab, which I put the link in the chat, um, you mentioned that you write for a reggae uh, 
or you you're a reggae writer, right? Did I say that right? I, I <laughs> might top have... shelf reggae. I'm I'm a huge fan of uh, reggae rock music, which is like I... it's, it's so random, um, which was really popular in the '90s. But it's like reggae um, and obviously rock music. And there's this blog that I write for called Top Shelf. It used to be called Top Shelf Reggae, but now it's called Top Shelf Music. But I I really go to concerts and review their, you know, the concerts there and I like, reviewed CDs and um, I just think it's really cool. I think it's also another personal thing because reggae rock um, is mostly white folks, a lot of white uh, males who participate in it. Um, hey, you're Jamaican, awesome. Um, <laughs> yes, that's a better, better way of explaining what my explanation was. But um, reggae rock obviously came from uh, California. And I think it's such a cool mix between like the different cultures. And a lot of folks are like, oh, my God, it's it's white people trying to do reggae music. But if you look at their roster, there's so many legendary reggae artists who like play with these reggae rock bands and I just think it's such an interesting cultural moment in marrying the two cultures um so I, I do write um for them along with uh this this organization called tribes um mm -hmm. and also I just I I love writing I love you know sharing people's stories and being a part of storyteller groups um you know out of Eden which is an organization out of National Geographic, yeah. um, I write for them. I'm really busy. Oh, wow. <laughs> I do a I, lot of stuff. Um, that looks crazy. But you, so, wow, you play music, you write, and you have founded uh, the Black Teaching Artist Lab, which came out of your work that you were doing as well. Could you tell us a little bit about the mission and the goals of Black Teaching Artist Lab? And also, Along with it, I know you have a strong passion around something called Afrocentric Social Emotional Learning Framework. Um, what is that? And, and could you share? It, that's a big question. So there's a lot to unpack all there. Sure. I, I think I'll start with Afrocentric Social Emotional Learning. Um, and it came from, again, the lack of resources for Black educators or tools for them to use. And a lot of the buzzword in arts education has been like social emotional. Oh, here it is. Wow. OK. Hey, <laughs> um, is, you know, social emotional learning. What is that? How can we incorporate that? Um, and we re I realized that social emotional learning does not work for the black child, right? So I developed the Afrocentric social emotional learning framework, which centers the black learner in their own social and emotional understanding of self using art practices. So for the first one you see is Afrocentric self-awareness, the ability to understand one's emotions, thoughts, values, and identity, and how these elements can influence behavior across contents and how one is ultimately perceived by society because of their skin color. Um, one of the things that I do in my workshop is talk more about what Afrocentric SEL uh, and self-awareness is. And I have a teaching artist, whether their backgrounds in fashion, their backgrounds in the theater or poetry, that they show us and walk through what that looks like through um, their own lens. So what does Afrocentric self-awareness looks like in um, dance? You could practice like a different dance move that, you know, is rooted in West African or, um, you know, with poetry, reciting a poet, that, poem from a poet who is, you know, black and figuring out what their emotions were. Um, so that's essentially what Afrocentric social emotional learning is. Uh, and I and I realized that, you know, these teaching artists really already do this. They already are familiar with it. And what I didn't realize is that folks who aren't black have a better understanding of their the lived experience of of uh their black learners you, you're never going to know what uh, you know someone else's experience of a different race you're never going to know that but looking at it through a lens of a social emotional experience through art helps us better communicate with each other um and and the feedback has been just really fantastic um, and really exciting because that's that's really what we were getting at the heart of when we talk about diversity and inclusion and, you know, anti-racism and bias training is, is really figuring out 
you know, having a better understanding and having having a way for us to communicate better. And, you know, I always say art education is that way to do it. And, and this is just I'm offering one way in which we could better communicate um, our thoughts and our feelings and our experience through an artistic lens. I love that. That's such a great way to engage uh, students and engage others in a in a great method. And I like what you said. It is difficult for, you know, I'm obviously, I'm a white man, right? It's difficult for me to understand a different race because I am this, you know, uh, race. I'm, I'm, I am myself. But I like how you said, you know, you can help people with a lens and it's it's important to make sure that our tools that we're, we're working with youth are based in that youth's actual, you know, culture and heritage to actually work with students. And what better way to do that than art, storytelling, and, and the all-encompassing field of that. Have you seen some really cool examples? I know you mentioned, um, you know, slam poetry uh, or poetry by maybe a black author, um, you know, uh, your work you're doing in bringing West African culture, you know, into into the scene here. What what's what's like your favorite example of that? Um, I think. I mean, I could. I, this may not be answering your question, but I thought more about it. Um, you know, I have one teaching artist, and I taught him Afrocentric SEL framework, and he's so cool. His name is Deshaun Hightower. Um, and he's a fashion, he's a textile artist, but he also teaches AP computer science and he also teaches graffiti. Like if anyone needs a teaching artist, please hire Deshaun. He's amazing. Um, and you know, I work predominantly with the teaching artists and not with students. So, and I don't feel like I'm at that point where like, I could see like the impact of, te of what the students feel like. It's, it's brand new. I started in February, but he did tell me um this really amazing story about how you know by learning the afrocentric sel framework he was able to incorporate culturally responsive teaching into his one of his classes and he was talking about graffiti and tagging and like the history of tagging and he was talking about how he had like korean students and he was like you know that he was telling the students that they should like tag in their uh, their native tongue and they were really excited about sharing that uh, with their classes and their and how they tagged it in different parts of the city um and incorporating that so it was really that was pretty cool to you know share that experience with like my with like what i can't like have in my head about my thoughts on afrocentric sel and then having my teaching artists look at it from their point of view and then having it have it translate to kids like that is what the goal is to do so um you know and also like looking at history and looking at social emotional learning through graffiti is really cool too and fashion um so always like you know when i do these trainings I, I always learn something new with these teaching artists by virtue of, I mean, I'm not a fashion designer. I'm not really a poet. Um, so it's just, it's always a learning collaborative space. It's a, it's a lab is what you would call it. I think that's awesome. I know. Um, so you have on your um, website, one of the uh, things that you're very passionate about and um, is collecting kind of stories or examples or artifacts that um, I think you call it Zora's legacy. Is that correct? Or mm -hmm. um, tell, tell us a little bit about, I'll bring it up on the screen, but tell us a little bit about that. Great. Yeah. So we actually partnered with Creative Generation um, and we named our study after Zora Neale Hurston, who was a 20th century uh, uh, ethnographer, cultural anthropologist. Um, and our goal for Zora's legacy is to collect data on black identifying teaching artists from across the United States, hopefully from across the diaspora, um, because there's actually hasn't been a study on black teaching artists um, as of yet. And so we're doing the first one, which is exciting. And right now we're doing the, um, the pre-report. So we're collecting just demographic data who are you? Where are you from? What's your age? Um, what's your background? I think you could click on the survey so you, folks could kind of see what kind of questions we're asking. 
Um, it only takes 10 minutes. So, you know, it's really cool that I coming up with these questions. Um, I've actually never seen a, a, um, a survey that talks about like different ethnicities within like the black experience. So we have like being you're black or you're um, African American. Um, yeah, mixed race, Afro Latino, and Afro uh, Black identifying, and the feedback has been great because it's you know some people have never even been asked those questions in order to have data. Um, so we created a pre-report, um, and this is a two to three year ethnographic research initiative that will allow us to have a better understanding of what are the needs in the communities. How can we as Black Teaching Artists Lab better support? Black teaching artists from across the diaspora. Um, and that will help inform us with the curriculum that we design, the traveling abroad that we hope to do soon. Um, you know, and overall, like, you, you know, schools have one of them, like, the, high, the most information about us. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's beneficial, sometimes it's not. Um, to have an organization like Black Teaching Artist Lab that has trademarked an Afrocentric SEL framework, um, you know, I own the business as well as collecting the data that's for us, by us, um, which I think is just really important um, and it says a lot about uh, who we are as an institution um, and what we, our, our legacy really wants to be, um, oh. which is independent. I love it because I love it. I'm going to go back up to your uh, one part of the survey. I love this data right here because so often um, we categorize things as black or people say African American. It depends how people sometimes how people feel, right? They're like, oh, I, I have to say African American because I can't say black, um, you know? And so people do that. But I love how you break it down. There are so many various elements to the black community right yeah and, i mean it's uh you know just right here you know like you said african-american african-caribbean afro-caribbean mixed race multiracial uh Af afro-latino or a black identifying latino i grew up i grew up in uh hawaii and we had um fijians and fijians are very dark-skinned individuals and would uh would be classified if they were to take the census as black, but that they actually find that kind of offensive because they're like, we're Fijian, you know? And so I love the fact that you're breaking this down and that you've been able to get some really cool stories. And this is going to guide some work around your, um, the idea of the Pan-African culture exchange. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So, um, our goal, if anyone is able to donate, uh, that would be great. We're raising funds to really start the process of launching Zora's Legacy, uh, which is um, Pan-African Cultural Exchange, um, and you know, getting grants and being able to send at least four to five teaching artists to Puerto Rico in, in order to create like lesson plans and um, you know, uh, learning about their Black identity, um, you, by using Afrocentric social emotional learning um, and also creating and developing quantifiable data. So they will actually be uh, culturally responsive learners and in whatever their institution that sends them there will be able to have lesson plans and curriculum that is culturally responsive. That is from Puerto Rico, from the stories from folks who are Puerto Rican. Um, and we're working closely with um, the Larissa community in Puerto Rico, in, in San Luce. Um, there's other communities in um, in Puerto Rico, but we're, we really want to focus on uh, the the majority Black communities there. Um, I could go into a whole spiel about why, um, but you know, when I learned about Puerto Rico, there's a lot of people like me that comes down and say, "Hey, I really want to help and want to tell your stories," and like they people leave and not actually do help and and actually you know do the work. So this year and last year, I I really worked dis diligently to make those connections and making sure that a we build trust and b like I'm in it for the long run. Uh, here, here are some, so I asked some teaching artists, these are all teaching artists that I know, very good friends of mine, uh, some are mentors, um, 
asking them why is it important to have a cultural exchange program you know tamara she said the beauty of a cultural exchange program is the very word exchange the very act and practice of seeing and experiencing art outside of our 10 block radius and having the opportunity to bring that back to wherever we are from is uh by by vitally important and necessary so you know, these are just yeah. small fractions of why, big fractions of why I do the work that I do. These folks are telling me, this is what I want. This is why it's important. This is what's gonna make my art better. This is how it's gonna make my teaching street uh, better as well. Um, and it's important to listen and, you know, important to, to, you know, do put in that work. I love what Victor says here. Um, so I've read all these and you know they're, they're very profound. I love his very last sentence here. To experience life in a place that is unconcerned with my blackness changed my life. I mean, to be able to just be you and, and live your life and live your truth. I mean, that's, that's amazing and powerful. That's really cool. I, I love this. What, um, what, what possessed you to do this? Um, you know, Sean, that was, this was my initial, like, desire. I wanted to send teaching artists to Porter, uh, to Ghana before, uh, the, the, the COVID happened. Because I think it was a year where it was like 400 years since the first slaves came to um, the United States. And... Um, there was a lot of birthright trips happening at that. It was like 2019 or 18, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I just had this idea of doing this cultural exchange and it was just really, really good idea. And that was my goal. I really just want to send teaching artists to Ghana, like hip hop artists and going, bringing them to Ghana. Um, and if it wasn't for COVID, I think that would still kind of be the genesis of what I'm doing. Um, but because I had a year of like, we can't travel and we can't go anywhere, um, it, it just morphed into like this sort of bigger idea of like, okay, we don't, we can't go to Ghana, but we could possibly go to Puerto Rico. And like, what does that mean if we go to Puerto Rico with this whole birthright? Okay, there, there's people who kind of look like me. Like, what does that mean? So there was a lot of like, you know, internal learning, external exper like exploration that I did um, because of COVID. There's there's obviously been a lot of negativity and, and tragedy because of COVID, but it also took, it, it gave me a time and a place where everyone kind of stood still and, you know, open to new ideas and able to you know, be open to exploring those new ideas. And I've been very fortunate that you know, because of that, I was able to sort of plan out and map out what Pan-African cultural exchange means. Um, and also, you know, kind of like, you know, being innovative in the world of professional development, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to pitch this to schools and having them, you know, be like, you know, look, like you want to do professional development, you want to help, you know, with diversity and inclusion, bring your teaching artists to Jamaica or Trinidad, spend a week there, you know, give them this opportunity to understand, you know, their black identity in, in a new and exciting way, as well as develop new curriculum in a new and exciting way, you know, creating media, creating, you know, art, cre developing or, um, uh, you know, Oh my God, let's partner. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I just think that's really, important you know i and i guess it's just me being young and being an exciting kid um or or just being really passionate I, it's a time that we gotta we gotta change like we the doe obviously wants you know new you know stuff and new curriculum and and i and we have to be open to change and we have to be open to trying things out you know again i just wanted to go to i was my heart was set to go to ghana and i was it took me a long it took me two to three months to just let go of that idea but you know when you start out doing something it, it may not be what your consumer wants or what 
you end up doing and that's okay but the most important thing is to try and to be innovative because that's where change really comes from i love it i love i love your focus on black identity and getting back so to speak to culture a lot of times in education we try to teach it through books and those books are written by a variety of people you know and it's always a challenge it's like what book do you choose which author what's the history of the book but your philosophy is like you know to take these artists and put them in these locations like puerto rico or or in the future ghana or all over the world you know as you continue to grow what what is the power of that? Like what, as you were starting to think about and you're starting to get gear up to send your first culture exchange to Puerto Rico, surely there's some, some challenges and some barriers that you may face. But I know you, just in the little bit we've gotten to know each other, you're a very positive person. You always take a positive approach. How has this all like affected you? And what, what are you doing to work through some of that? And why is it so important? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> no, it's all connected though, right? Um, I, I still the first question is, you know, the benefits. And I think, you know, I I feel like a lot of Black educators or Black people in general, um, when they're in uh, PWIs or predominantly white spaces or institutions, they oftentimes feel like they're speaking for their whole race and they, and I know I could get caught up in that and like generalizing and stereotyping, which is happening, I think, more often. And even though we like to think we're moving in the right direction, like there's a lot of stereotyping, you know, not, you know, people are diverse and to assume that all black people want the same thing is falls in the realms of the wrong, you know, lens. Right. And for me, like I, I have a very indiv individualistic um philosophy I, I am you know really independent and i want people to know who i am and who i am as melissa park oftentimes when you're black you're all your own you are just that the black person or you're the black girl um and you fall into that and that's that's you know because of my unique experience and i was unfortunately the only black person in my class for until high school and I never had a black educator, but I never felt like I was the black kid, you know, the only, maybe people thought that, but I never felt that, um, which m made me think of how important it is to build your core identity. And, you know, we are individuals, our black identity is always a part of us, but we are individuals and being in a space where you could be your individual person but also knowing that you're a part of this really big community, which is the Pan-African, you know, diaspora, if you are, Afri if you're not from Africa, um, is really interesting and important, you know, like me going to Puerto Rico, I, I learned so much about the culture and being Puerto Rican, but also we are connected because of our experiences, blackness. And exactly. if you go to B B uh, Brazil, like you, you learn so much about the history about a place by looking at the black experience you learn about the socioeconomic experience by looking at the black experience so there's so much potential in developing historical narratives and and you know content and you know also there's like a political part per, perhaps like us gathering as nations i know this caricom but you know having an art association between our culture it, there's so much potential um and i'm hoping to to for people and other folks to see that um sounding like a revolutionary but i'm like really i i do see the potential in doing this and um you know it's it's hard you know there's i am again sometimes I forget that I am American and a lot of folks, you know, I, I don't know even the history of Puerto Rico, but, you know, be being American, you you know, there may be some contention because Puerto Rico is, is colonized by America and, and are not treated the best. Like, I mean, it's horrible. And, and I don't, I don't necessarily blame some folks who are hesitant because of my, you know, because I'm American, but, um, you know, it, it, that's just kind of the work that you do. And, and it's like, 
I'm just I, I I'm just very fortunate that people have been supportive of me and things get hard and um, foundations have been really the your organization has been also just amazing support system and you know arts education partnership and creative generations and I have a lot of work aunties who I cry to and having those a big support system is is critical when you're doing this work so um, yeah yeah I I think it's 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 so powerful and what you're talking about is so powerful because so I grew up uh, outside of America more than in America I mean I was I, my dad's military so we we're always on military bases but we were like in Japan or the Philippines or I mean Hawaii is America um, sometimes we forget that in Hawaii because just like Puerto Rico Hawaii was uh, illegally overthrown uh, colonized basically for sugarcane um, and, and the, the local Hawaiians, the Hawaiian people have gone through that. And I love your focus though on getting back, you know, being po positive about it. And you said, you know, I'm sounding like a revolutionary. And it's funny because I would say sometimes you need a revolution to change the world, you know? So it's okay uh, <laughs> because we all need to reframe things, right? We need to think about this. And I love how you're focusing. Oh, interesting. Um, at how you can get dual citizenship and dip, uh, and different uh, countries. Um, we were talking yesterday and I love this conversation. You were talking a little bit about, you know, about uh, the Pan-African uh, and I'm saying it incorrectly. So you may have to correct me. Diaspora, diaspora. It's Di pronounced. I think I pronounce it differently. I say di diaspora. 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 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I um, might be saying it wrong too, but it's all, it's, we all know what we're talking about. <laughs> but you really opened up my eyes in our conversation because I've always thought of, when we think of education, I've always been like, oh, we teach Western education, you know, why don't we teach Eastern? I hadn't thought of teaching, you know, what is the African philosophy? What is the, um, I mean, obviously there's West Africa, there's also East Africa and South, there's different vibes to all of Africa and people forget that, that it is a continent in itself and has, you know, 50 or more various cultures and even more tribal um, uh, uh, tribal entities throughout the whole continent. Um, but I love, I love how you framed it. You know, everybody's different and you, you shared something with me that you do, uh, and it's part of your goals and you, you called it the three pillars. What are the three pillars? What is that all about? It's great. Um, but you're really good. Like you are such a good, um, host cause, um, yeah, so we have our three pillars that we um, use and, and help structure us. Um, and it's self understanding who you are and your black identity. Um, and then you go into culture and then you go into community. Um, and you, as you read, we believe these three pillars will provide black teaching artists with the foundational knowledge, strength, and confidence they need to be strong leaders and educators. Um, so the first pillar is self. So we teach the Afrocentric SEL framework. And it's really, again, I have a Montessori background, so it's, it's not even teaching it, but like providing a um, uh, uh, a structure when you think of a framework a frame is really just refocusing your eyes on a certain thing so teaching artists already do afrocentric sel just giving them that language right um and for folks who may not know afrocentric sel or folks who are not um a part of the pan-african diaspora um giving them also that language too so um we do work workshops virtual workshops right now um we you know vaccinated so <laughs> we could do in person if you're interested please email me um at info at blackteachingartistlab.com um so once the teaching artist is provided with that knowledge we move into culture which is the pan-african cultural exchange and we send those teaching artists out into the communities puerto rico hawaii uh belize and providing them with the opportunity to to go and do afrocentric SEL framework um, workshops um, in their art medium and do lesson planning and really communicate with each other. It's a creative kind of incubation process. And then you move into um, community, which is kind of, it's more or less, um, you know, research based and for, from on my end, but 
the idea is that the teachers come back and they have a better sense or a better a, a greater way of communicating with their black learners um with their own experience so it's a little bit like a fellowship arts residency learning thought bubble in retreats travel like cultural exchange <laughs> i haven't come up with a good word for it but it has elements of all of those things um and it's beneficial for everyone involved um and it's just incredibly exciting uh but we hope that those three pillars um help guide our teachers um who go through this experience um and building a, a stronger sense of self and uh their own black identity that's amazing. I mean, I love that so far, just in the last, you know, 50 minutes that we've been talking, we've talked about, you know, um, Afrocentric uh, SEL, basically the Pan-African Cultural Exchange, your history, your background, your beliefs. And um, we've talked about Zora's legacy. We've talked about your three pillars um, and people in the audience today are really connecting. Um, you know, we have a lot of folks who are sharing, you know, teach indigenous education that's, you know, worthwhile. Um, Amani is sharing, you know, indigenous wisdom has medicine, art, engineering, architecture, cosmology, um, regenerative framing, science. There's so many, by the way, she, uh, she or he, I apologize. Um, I don't, Amani, excuse me, also has a, pr a Montessori background. Um, <laughs> so, so many connections. So we got about, we got about seven minutes before we have to wrap up or six minutes. Can I ask you if, if, if you could do one thing to change the world, one thing in your, in your work, you're already doing it. But if I told you, narrow it down to just one philosophy, one thing, what would that be? What would you tell our audience? Um, I would tell everyone to uh, start with love. I think it's really important to, you know, start with genuinely loving what you do and like loving. I like have such a bad habit of saying I love you like really too quickly, but I don't really care. Like if I connect with you and I believe in what you're doing, like, like there's love there, you know, the work that I do, you know, especially, you know, I'm, I'm in a fellowship right now and it's like talking about competition, like who's your competition? And I'm like naming all of my competition. And I'm like, wait, but they're my family. Like we call each other cousins, like sister organizations. Like, you know, it's really familiar or like it's, it comes from that space. And I think it's also like a cultural thing. Um, but it just, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be successful if I didn't have that sense of like, okay, like, I want the best for you, you want the best for me, and we want the best for the world. And I think that comes from a place of like, coming from a place of love and coming from a place of like, you know, trust as well. So, you know, be open to that. And um, I think the world would be so much better if we just like, you know, we think about love in this romantic sense or familiar sense, but, you know, love is like, you know, really it comes down to communicating and trust and that's that's what it is in essence so um i think if we go into a situation with that i think we you know there's no reason not to it just makes things a lot better there's more people you can trust and people that you can't trust in the world so um i think that's really important something i learned through this own, my own personal journey so love one another <laughs> I so connect with that. I mean, it takes so much energy to hate, you yeah. know, it, it really does. It takes so much energy to, to funnel hate. Whereas love, love almost grows on itself and builds on itself. And it's like, it's like at never stopping. So I love that philosophy. Thank you. I, I am going to play the host that, that asks a, a challenging question around that though. You're extremely positive and I love your vibe. You totally have this positive vibe that generates off of you and makes people feel better just talking to you and being in your presence. This is the first time we've actually seen each other face to face. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I know bad things happen in the world and we, we work, a lot of people on the line right now work with some really challenging situations, students that are in uh, abject poverty, um, 
uh, teachers that are that are facing um, uh, administrations that may not respect their own culture or understand where they're coming from. The uh, the American experience right now is very polarized sometimes. How do you stay so positive and stay focused on that love when sometimes these bad things just happen? Any advice for those on the line? Um, I'm so happy that you think like that. no you know I, I am really positive i am a really positive person but i have to say like i am really struggling right now like i am first of all i'm not feeling well <laughs> that's another yeah. one thing um but second like i've been trying to find a job for four months and i haven't heard anything back um you know, and, and hearing like all these positive things that are happening in my work life and also getting rejection letters from jobs. It's like, why? Like what's happening to me? And it sucks, you know, and I'm he trying to hear back from this job after two months of applying and it's like, keep asking for more information. And it's, it's emotionally really taxing, but things like that pass, like, you know, and it could get you down all you got to do is just it will pass things happen things will pass nothing's permanent just temporaryisms there's certain things obviously that are worse than most but that's the case for a lot of things and a lot of things could be you know worse and i just have to be thankful that i have amazing family i have you know i don't have to worry about bills i don't have to you know my health is relatively good so just staying in that headspace is really important um because if you if you again if you stick in the negativity you gotta you know you're gonna be negative you gotta always be positive it's so i'm on it's really harder than it didn't sounds um uh, you know, but it's worth it. It's so worth it. Well, I think, I think you're destined for great things. I think, you know, as Imani says, you know, she's sending healing vibes to you. Um, and she says, you know, you're a boss. Uh, maybe you shouldn't be working for someone else. Definitely. You know, we want to get uh, black teaching artist lab up and running and, you know, uh, have you, you know, share your truth around the world and continue, you know, to share your talent, <laughs> bringing that positive energy out there. And that's what, I mean, you can read the comments. I see the comments. You know? I definitely so, thought about those. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and it's, it's, it will happen, but let me, let me ask, and this is kind of my one last question, then we got to wrap up, but um, what is it, what's the future for you? Like where, where do you envision everything going? I mean, obviously there's, there's the financial aspect. We have to have resources to do things, right? So um, like every good educator artist uh, or artist educator or just artist period or just educator, sometimes, you know, we got to have side hustles. We got to have different things going on. Sometimes our passion is our side hustle. Um, so we have to have resources, but what's what's the vision for you and what's the, what's the future hold? Future um, is having teaching artistry, like teaching education be like implemented in um, like, so if the, people get certified in schools, like they get a degree in teach artistry, which is sort of quasi happening right now. So I'm like trying to get on that bandwagon mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, providing this Pan-African cultural exchange in institutions um and making sure that you know black teaching artist lab isn't the only space that this happens like this just has to happen you know collectively and we have to provide more resources and tools for our black educators in order for us to reach our black learners in order for there to be the next generation of leaders who don't have to do research and have to go through this process the you know the thing I want, you know, I, I never want someone to be like, oh, like, I want to be just like you. It's like, no, 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 no. You're not doing the same thing as I am. You're going to do better than me. That's my goal. You will, you know, you have the research. You Here's a foundation, no tool for you to use. And now, you know, do more than I can. That's that's the goal for the future. Um, and I'm excited because I feel like I'm, I'm just almost there. I feel it. And you know, it's going to be a whole different conversation when, you know, teaching artists go to Puerto Rico and have the experience and start the cycle. Um, that That's the 
go, but I'm gonna plug one more thing, which is sure, yeah. the Pan-African Cultural Exchange. We are trying to raise money. I hate asking people for money, but um, we do need your support. We're asking folks, here's the link to it. Um, if you can donate 25 to $50, if you can't, if you get anything helps. Um, but we're really trying to get money to start with grant writing and hopefully go down for a week to Puerto Rico. I have some really cr amazing connections um, with the Museum de Arte. Um, so we're hoping to do some workshops with the museum there, um, along with incorporating the local community leaders in Puerto Rico. But it takes the community has help. Um, so if you're able to donate, please. Um, and if you can't, like, send it to people you know who who can. So, um, yes, thank you. I just this was great. This has made my day, um, and just great having conversations about work that we're all passionate about. Well, let me let me wrap this up, Melissa. By first of all, thanking you, thanking you for being you and for all the work that you do. Um, I know it is it is tough sometimes with everything, but just in the time that I've gotten to know you, you have a total positive vibe. You look on the positive outlook on life. And I really do believe that positivity in the universe comes back to you triple fold. Like uh, people on this line, we are, we are in this community together. We help each other out. If you read the comments, you'll see uh, folks are already chiming in uh, who want to help and want to want to see your vision because what you're doing bringing uh, awareness around Black identity, making sure people drive back to roots, making sure people understand that culture is owned by the individual, not by the color of their skin. Um, what you're doing is breaking barriers across America. You should be super, super proud if I can uh, arrogantly say so myself. I mean, you should be super proud. You're, you're a model, you're a hero, a heroine. Thank you for all that you do. And we look forward um, to having you live at our show in Orlando at the Beyond School Hours <laughs> Conference with our, our other panelists um, or other guests, I should say. And so that people can meet you, talk to you. As I say, we can go have lemonade at the bar or something, <laughs> you know, and, and just celebrate life and celebrate your work. So with that, thank you. I am going to turn the time back to Elizabeth and Melissa, have a great day. Thank you so much for taking an hour out of your busy day to share what you do, your passion, and you, to share you. It's been fun. Thank you, and thank you, Elizabeth, um, and everyone at Foundations and everyone here. It was awesome. <laughs> thank you both. Sean, another amazing um, edition of Perspectives from the Field. Melissa, we are so grateful to just be a part of your journey, and you know, you're, um, you're welcome on this platform anytime to get your message out. So thank you for joining us. This has been an incredible conversation. I'm so excited about the work to come. Um, again, like everyone has said, I think you are destined for great things. So again, we're just happy. To, we're just happy to be involved. Um, and as Sean said, if you are interested in the live show, please join us in Orlando, February 23rd through the 26th. Um, we'll make sure that the, the link is in the chat. Um, follow us on social media, Foundations Inc. Um, we are on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we get some interesting content out, uh, out there for you to follow and share. Um, there's a survey that we would love for you to take some time to, to fill out and let us know how we're doing. Our next perspectives is, I believe, December 17th, Sean, am I right? So join us then. We have another really interesting uh, conversation with Jeff Poland from Creative Generation. I do want to note that Jeff is my mentor. So I know, that's he, crazy. What's it's, such a small world? It's a small world. He's amazing. If anyone can make it, uh, please go over there and support it on the, in December. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Please um, keep an eye out for 